Good morning. Back with another dog walk diary. There's Flo, trotted along by the lake. I'm surprised she hasn't jumped in there. It's not quite so warm today, so maybe that's why. Yeah, we're at episode six of the Coach Education is Broken series. This is the sixth system shift that we're talking about, which is the, the kind of the ways of thinking and the um, approaches we need to consider to transform and change coach education. And this one, again, speaking to coaches, doing research, commissioning research, synthesizing research and discussing things with those who are designing and building coach education systems and feeling constrained or articulating challenges. This is where all of this comes from. It's a distillation of consultation exercises, but also some of the engagement that happens via either face-to-face -face engagements or through the dialogue that I would have through the various different that I'm involved with and communities that I engage with, organisations that I engage with on a regular weekly basis. System shift. System shift. Easy for me to say. Six is called embrace complexity so one of the things that's really interesting about when you talk to people about coach education is that uh, there is a inherent bias I think in the way a lot of people think about coach education and it's not necessarily explicit but it's betrayed in some of the language used what a lot of people are familiar with is levels so you have a level one, a level two, a level three, a level four, some sports are moving away from those titles and using more descriptive language to describe roles. You might have coaching assistant, you might have lead coach, you might have sessional coach, you might have, sometimes there's letters, you have B, A, B, C, license so this is all the kind of language that's used but in general what all of those things are basically just different ways of describing the same thing and the same thing that's being described is essentially a linear coach development journey and that linear coach development journey is usually follows a journey that is similar to a talent development journey, a linear talent development journey where uh, hu humans are starting out as young people who are beginners or in the early stages of their sporting journey and they progress into a talent pathway and they progress into more of a performance space than high performance type elite realm and coach development has generally been designed around that so if you look around the world what you'll generally see, and not, it's not in all cases, there are really good examples of not like this, but what you will generally see is that at level four, the so-called expert coach, master coach level, there, that is usually coaches coaching in a high performance context. So if you're a coach who is, let's say, working with a group of adolescents in a community that's got very high levels of social and economic deprivation. And you're working with young people who've got quite, high, quite, quite, cons quite uh, considerable social, maybe, needs, and also maybe some, some physical needs or psychological needs, emotional needs, because of the kinds of environments they operate within. Generally speaking, you'll be a level two. And the level two, the level carries with it, whether we like it or not, explicitly or otherwise, a designation. And the designation is the standard of coach. And so you, you never see, and I, I'm yet to see an example of an organisation do this effectively. You never see... It's a level four children's coach. 
when I came into my current role, I one of the things I asked of a number of organisations was, at one stage, everybody was talking about how we could recognise a master coach of children, level level four coach of children, level five coach of children. Uh, recognising, of course, the inherent challenges that working with young people brings, particularly as they develop and you have to progress as they do. And nobody could answer that question, even though it's something that was being talked about 20 years ago. 20 years on, still to this day, nobody, sorry, there probably are examples I haven't come across, but generally very few organisations involved in the development of coach education systems have found a way to recognise coaches of children, coaches of young people, and recognise their expertise as advanced practitioners, expert practitioners, master practitioners. No one has. Sorry, not no one. Keep, keep ca catching myself because there's a there might be a few out there, but I'm not yet. I'm yet to see it. I'd love people to write in and tell me and show me what they're doing because I'd be really excited to see it. I'd love to get them on the show. Talk about it in more detail and the journey that, that took. Why? Part of it's to do with the fact that education systems in the wider world are generally pretty linear. And obviously, coach education is no different. In general, it has modelled itself on linear models. So there is a linear progression from newbie, neophyte, beginner coach to expert coach, and that tracks domains. And in some cases, you can't even apply to be a level four coach if you aren't in a high performance domain. And again, the assumption being that the high performance domain is a more complicated and a more complex domain, which requires a lot more expertise. I do not agree. Most people I speak to do not agree. And the fact that we don't recognize and have really high performing coaches, coaching young people, even coaching people at the beginning of their journey is still to my mind, a massive impoverishment of the sporting system. Interestingly enough, there's a famous practitioner, a guy called Istvan Bayi, who at one stage was one of the creators of, of the long-term athlete development framework. There's a lot of debate and discussion about long-term athlete development and its veracity and this, that and the other. But anyway, as a construct, this idea of thinking more long-term about athletic development and connecting both the performance and the participation realms and all those sorts of things. I think there's still very many ideas in that are still worth holding on to. It still actually exist to this day. Albeit there's a lot of linearity in that as well, so we probably need to consider that. Anyway, one of the things he said was, in, he came from Czechoslovakia, I think, but one of the countries who was in the Eastern Bloc and he defected. He said one of the things that they used to do in the Eastern Bloc was that the club coach, the coach working with the young people on the developmental journey, used to get paid more than the national coach and was recognised as having more expertise than the national coach, or at least an equivalent amount of expertise, because they recognised that their job was harder. The job of the national coach, high performance coach, was in relative terms simpler, because you're dealing with extremely high performing athletes, and in principle, that kind of really hard yards of development and developmental activity have been done. I'm oversimplifying, obviously, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's what they did. And again, I don't necessarily say that we should all follow an Eastern Bloc approach, but it's still something that they did and worth mentioning. So from my perspective, one of the things that I think we need to consider is how do we, not just even me, but one of the things I think people are saying they need us to consider is how do we shift, thinking back to all the other system shifts and things like changing the paradigm and transformation, not transaction, and all these sorts of different ideas. How do we shift people's thinking so that we recognize that <clears throat> in actual fact, 
Coaches don't really exist on a linear journey. They exist in a really much more messy journey than that. And in reality, what happens is they're operating across multiple domains through their developmental journey. They might spend a small amount of time in a high performance space or even a talent development space. And the rest of the time they're spent doing the hard yards in a club context or in a community space. If you take, for example, martial art, the world of martial arts and boxing, those coaches are very often working, running clubs and supporting young people through really quite difficult sort of psychological, emotional, economic, mental hardships and difficulties, whilst at the same time doing really high level job of developing talent and sometimes taking young people through into international amateur ranks, into professional boxing. It's the full gamut. But they might only have a level two. <laughs> and it makes the sort of construct of a level two almost meaningless. Again, going back to this idea of the fact that people are on this developmental journey that is like meandering and they go in different places and they go down different rabbit holes and they reverse out and they all go down these and but their developmental journey is not a linear one it's a it's a really up and down roundabout sometimes there's stagnation sometimes there's progression sometimes there's uh, outward progression from within their construct sometimes they stay where they are for a period of time but they still really develop because they happen to be learning a lot from the space that they're in and you do have in my opinion a lot of people out there who are genuine experts they are experts in the people that they work with. They are experts in the context that they're operating within. They're experts at the task that they have, which is continuously flexing and being variable. And the mechanism for recognition of that expertise needs to radically change. Now, likewise, think about this as well. So what about if you're an individual and you're not in the kind of norm as in you're not who a lot of coach education was designed for often coach education was designed by people like me aging white males who design coach education in their own image based on the experiences that they went through and it repeats you can actually see this in quite a lot of coach education literature if you really dig into it you actually see there's a really implicit male bias. Even the way coach education is designed, as in the way it's structured, it's at weekends, it's at evening, it's designed around particular learning modes. And the example I often give is, um, there's a particular, not quite a few of them actually, quite a few activities, where if you want to engage as a becoming a, an instructor in that space, you've got to do a like a full week course or two-week course and you've got to commit nine to five and then there's home study let's say if you're a single parent male or female or anything in between you and you've got caregiving responsibilities you're not going to do that so the learning and development system has linearity to it as well and that, that has an issue but then beyond all that if you think about the developmental journey of a human and the way that they're going to operate so I mentioned this before you've got people who've got like experiences as outside of the sports realm that they're gaining from, that don't really have any, that, that are never given any relevance, even in this notion of accredited or recognized prior learning, APL or RPL, it's still not really done that well. We're not really recognizing people from the learning experiences they've gained from other contexts and, it's and any transferability they may have into their, a space. People learn things in their business, in their day-to-day -day work. People learn things from interacting with other humans in, in, in other volunteering sex sections. So someone, say, working with like uniform groups like scouts and guides are learning lots of things about young people and development of young people and supporting young people. But that's not really given any credence or recognition when it comes to the sports realm because we assume that the sports realm is different. It's not really, there's just lots of this. We're all talking about dealing with human beings, not dealing with, but interacting with and supporting human beings as they progress through life. And there's a lot of transferability from these domains, but the recognition is not ever provided there. And then finally, the other thing to consider is going back to this notion of difference. So again, things are designed around that a particular avatar, a particular human, generally speaking, somebody who's operating in a particular domain, usually a club. 
But if you're not operating in that domain, like how does the, how is the kind of education and support relevant to you? And in particular, if you're from a particular community, so for example, and this is, there's no, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, and it's only relatively recently that an organization that is heavily involved in the development of education for coaches was running a coaching course for a group of blind coaches using PowerPoint slides that they can't read with no real kind of forethought around adaptation. Obviously, that's an issue from the diversity perspective in terms of engaging, engaging people from a range of different backgrounds, but also attracting people into the coaching space, recognising them where they are. So there is an inherent complexity to coach education journeys that isn't necessarily recognised by linear pathways. And so what often happens is people from outside the normal realm, these normal environments that these education courses are designed from, they do these courses because they've got no choice. They have to do them because otherwise they can't be licensed or insured or whatever it is. But it really has very little relevance for them. Whereas in reality, being able to support an individual based on the context they're operating within, understanding their needs particularly in order to be able to service the audience groups is really important. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned as well, and that's reminding me, is of course a lot of these designs as well are designed around this sort of developmental journey for athletes so we develop an athlete development curriculum and then we develop a coach education curriculum around that athlete development curriculum now i'm not saying that's necessarily wrong in actual fact it doesn't happen often enough and it really should be de designed in that way however it only really takes into consideration a series a very limited space, a number of spaces where we believe that developmental activity takes place. But the reality is developmental activity takes place in a range of different contexts and the coaches who operate within them operate in a range of different contexts and coach education should be relevant to that. So curriculum design needs to shift. It needs to not really think through, oh, we've got these athletes in these spaces and coaches that we need to develop to work in those spaces because that's a small number. A recent assessment done by one of the organisations I work with is that it's around about 24%. So 24% of coaches are actually operating in those spaces. So we're servicing coaches for a particular very narrow and relatively limited space in a very fairly rigid developmental journey. There's about, so the 70 odd outside of that are actually operating in what, what's often referred to as the kind of the grey or the non-regulated spaces. Those non-regulated spaces are actually like places like leisure centres and schools and community centres and private gyms and private spaces that are hired or, or owned by these individuals who operate in those spaces. It can be parks increasingly, universities, all these different spaces. They're not entirely unregulated, obviously, because there are people there and making sure that people do the right thing. But broadly speaking, it's a different context that isn't necessarily being serviced. So there's a lot to this notion of non-linearity. So non-linearity is a really important construct to consider. So actually starting in place, meeting people where they're at, with who they're working, with the tasks that they have, and working backwards to design an optimised learning experience for those individuals. Now that can be mapped against a centralised curriculum. No, no reason you can't do that. Um, but in actual fact, the way that happens is then that people are then recognised for the skills that they're developing, in, not in a, you do this and you do this kind of way, but in a ah, oh, you've just developed some skills and you can evidence and you can show that you've got some skills or you can explain to me that you've got some skills that you've developed in this context relevant to you. I can recognise you against a centralised framework, something that's much more flexible and dynamic. Those frameworks are, are relative, not easy, but relatively easy to develop. Um, what they're, they're much harder to implement, I agree with that. I'm happy to talk to anybody about implementation and happy to support any organisations with that, with how we can consider this journey of implementation because there's a lot of different jigsaw pieces that you need to consider, which is one of the reasons people, generally speaking, speaking don't do it. But it's, it is very doable as long as you've got a clear idea. And the problem you've got often very much is when it comes to these notions of these system shifts, they all work inter interconnectedly. You can't just do one without the other. You can't just look at a different element without the other. Anyway, lots of rambling, as I said earlier. Love to talk more with, to any organisation about this. Happy to support. And equally, please feel free to fire in comments. Send me some examples if you think, if you're doing it differently. Robert, come here. 
Um, she's just about to walk into the road as I'm talking to you. And uh, also please share this as much as you can with as many people as you can, because I think it's important that we try and get some of these messages out there because there's a lot of coaches out there being not necessarily being serviced that well. Anyway, better go and save this dog from walking into the road. Nice to chat to you. Speak to you again soon. Bye.